right, you can turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're going to spend several weeks here in chapter 2 looking at an important event, a climactic event in the history of the church of Jesus Christ. We call it Pentecost. Many refer to it as the birthday of the church. Uh, there's a few outliers who, who don't appreciate that characterization, but I, I would tend to agree with that. I won't ask everyone to sing happy birthday today, but that we are going to begin to look at how the church started. Obviously, there's a lot that led up to it in redemptive and biblical history up to this moment, and we have and will continue to point to some of those uh, elements of continuity and prophecy and things of that sort. Um, but something really special happened on this very real day in history that has uh, implications even now for us as we understand what it means to be a church on mission. That idea of the church having a birthday is also a useful metaphor because when we think about, I mean, I say we, but when ladies think about and then tell us men what it's like, we, we try our best to relate to the sense of longing, of expectation that goes with the up to 40 weeks or more, I guess I was like a month late, so of, of waiting for the arrival. There's this moment, you, you're hoping it's a joyful day, you know, where you're longing for that to happen. There's longing for it leading up to the event. In addition to the longing, there's actually a lot of pain associated with the progress, the labor, leading up to it. Uh, so there's a lot. There's a lot of preparation that goes into it. I remember that my wife, like many other women, had like a go bag ready to go about halfway through. You know, you've got your playlist plan for what you want to listen to while you're in labor. It seems to me like that did not matter <laughs> by the time you got there. But there, there are ideas leading up to it about, about what you expect and how you plan. But there's a plan, you know. So there's a lot of those kinds of things here embedded in that idea of this being the birthday of the church. A lot of expectation, there's some pain, there's a plan, there's, there's all these kinds of things leading up to this climactic moment. And as we continue to work through chapter 2, uh, beginning next week, we're going to get to look at Peter's sermon, where he really explains for us the significance of Pentecost. Today we're going to focus on the narrative portion of, of the account of the first Pentecost for the church, um, which is... I guess in the minds of some can feel like dry history, but again, when we really understand the momentousness of this occasion, I think we'll find this a little bit more than just a dry history lesson. So we'll read the text in just a moment. Before that, let's pray. Father, it is, it is sobering to reflect on the fact that we are here all these years later, standing in the way, in the tradition of what happened on this day. That when it was time and you poured out your Holy Spirit on 120 faithful followers of Jesus, then here 2,000 years later, there is a movement all across the globe and we have the privilege and the honor of being a part of it. Father, I ask that you would continue to remind us of that fact that we are inheritors of this, of this great truth and that we would not be stingy with it, that we would liberally and joyfully act like those that went before us in getting out the word. We thank you, Lord. I pray that you would be with us today, guide our thoughts and our, and our hearts for your glory and the building up of your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll work through the text today with two primary chunks. We'll, we'll look at the reality of Pentecost, so sort of in history, the reality of Pentecost, and then we'll examine the initial reaction to what happened on the day of Pentecost. So the reality and the reaction. And after we do that, we'll, we'll step back and, and very briefly look at a couple things, uh, big picture, um, that are implications of this text. So first, let's look at the reality of Pentecost. We read about this in the first four verses of our text today. And in verse 1, we get a sense of its roots. Right off the bat, we're going to get some insight into the fact that what happened on this day didn't come out of nowhere, that some things led up to this. Peter will elaborate this on this when we get to his message next week. But there, even here, just in verse 1, there are hints of it if you know what to look for. 
Verse 1 simply says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Trust me, a lot went into that. For time's sake, I won't read them, but I'll write down, give you a couple of references. One in particular, if you'd like to go read this, in Leviticus 23. And in fact, if you're with the Bible recap, you're probably almost there, or maybe right, right there. So um, you'll be reading this. So this will go along perfectly with our message today. Uh, probably this week, if, if I believe, if you're on pace. So Leviticus 23 lays out a feast, one of, one of several Jewish feasts, but one in particular that is relevant for our discussion today about Pentecost. It's called the Feast of Weeks. It's one of three of their feasts that required for the worshiper, all male Jews, to actually go on a pilgrimage, pilgrimage and come to Jerusalem. So in order for them to to do what they're supposed to do, they actually had to travel from where they lived to Jerusalem, to the temple, in order to participate. So this happened three times a year, and this was one of those feasts. This feast we took place 50 days after another pretty important feast we know as Passover. So 50 days, that's where we get the term Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. Now, strictly speaking... The Feast of Weeks was an offering of first fruits from the harvest. And the idea was this. I rescued you from Pharaoh, from Egypt. I brought you out so that I could take you to the promised land. So when you get there, I want you to do this. Uh, not just once, but every year. So it's a calendar thing. But it is a sign of remembrance that God brought us out, and he brought us to the promised land. And in recognition of the fact that this fruit is his provision, we offer back some of that to him as an honor to him. This was called um, the Feast of Weeks or of First Fruits. So this one would come at the end of the harvest season. Uh, wheat was the particular grain that was involved in this one. But it was a reminder of what God had done for them, a reminder of God's provision for their lives, both materially and spiritually, or we might say civically. He delivered them from bondage. And in remembrance to that fact that they were set free and provided for, this was the purpose of this feast. So strictly speaking, that's what the Feast of Weeks is. You can read all about that in Leviticus 23. In time, it, it sort of inherited a, a deeper meaning. It became intimately associated with the giving of the covenant. So at Mount Sinai, when Moses goes up and he meets with God, and he gives them the law, and then he covenants with the people of Israel. This feast became uniquely and intimately associated with that event. Uh, that event. It was a way of commemorating it. We can get there biblically by, by a various bits of deduction, by reading a verse here and there, a random passage in Deuteronomy, you know, that kind of thing. We put it all together, and we're able to deduce that that event, the giving of the law, would have taken place, say, six to eight weeks or right around 50 days after the initial exodus out of Egypt. And so the timing is about right. There's no verse that says it was precisely 50 days after, but it's, it's right in there. And, we, and we, we can say that with some measure of confidence. But then extra biblically, so we have writings like in the Book of Jubilees and in various Jewish writings, this really did become part of the traditional understanding of it. It became part of the, the trappings of the holiday, if you will. It was, it was the expectation of the people to set aside time and energy to think about this fact that God had delivered them from Egypt so that they could covenant at Mount Sinai. So that was the religious pattern of the 120 that they were used to. And they associated the Feast of Weeks with Sinai and the giving of the establishment of that covenant. Now that's going to come into sharper focus later on, and we will take a few minutes at the end of today's message to do that. Uh, I think we can see at least five or more ways that in the end, Acts 2 can be seen as a fulfillment, a sort of the ultimate expression of a feast of weeks. Hold that thought, we'll come back to it. But in summary, before we move on, the basic idea is that Pentecost was associated with the first fruits of God's provision for his people once they had arrived in the promised land. That is, after freeing them from their bondage to Egypt, 
and it's, a, it's tied to the establishment of the covenant that was established at Mount Sinai. So we have those three very basic ideas embedded in there. Those 120 who were gathered all together in one place were probably participating in this feast at this time. These are Jewish believers, and I don't see any reason to think that they would have opted out of these things at this point. They're all in the right place. It was their usual pattern to participate in these things at this time. So since the Holy Spirit hasn't yet come, the New Testament hasn't yet been written, I have every reason to believe that they were all preparing and participating in this feast when this occurred. So here, here it is, verses 2 and 3. Here's the explanation of the Pentecost. Let's read it first. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. You know from experience that some things are just impossible to adequately describe. You read this verse and you ought to get the sense that that's exactly the issue here. That Luke is grasping for the right words to describe what happened. And, and that's why we make use of poetry and songs. A way, it's a way of saying, I can't communicate sufficiently with words. So I'm going to summon other things. I'm going to employ other tactics to try to communicate to you what happened. And indeed, Luke is doing that a little bit. He's employing metaphors or similes, actually. You all learned that like and as. Well, that's actually what he says. He doesn't say that, that, there, that there was a mighty rushing wind or there were tongues of fire. He says there was a sound and a sight, and the sound was like a mighty rushing wind, and this sight the, was like tongues of fire. These are similes. What he's trying to do is say there was something that was truly heard, something that was really seen, and I couldn't possibly tell you exactly what that thing was, but here's, here's the best shot I can make. And he describes something that even in the words is pretty remarkable. A mighty rushing wind and divided tongues of fire on their head? That's crazy. Something pretty remarkable clearly happened here. So Luke is employing these rhetorical devices in an attempt to explain the unexplainable. That doesn't mean, however, let's just be clear, that this is all one big metaphor, that what he's describing was just sort of spiritualese for a feeling. No, something really happened on this day. We need to be clear about that. He's using similes to bring clarity to the historical fact of what happened, not to disregard it as history. So in other words, Luke is actually offering empirical evidence for this event. Empiric empiricism, our senses. He's saying there was a sound. There was a sight. We heard and saw things that ver verify that this thing happened. So quite to the contrary, he's not using similes to, to be spiritual. He's using similes to be clear that this thing really happened. And in fact... It was seen and heard, not just by the people in that room, but in great dramatic fashion. What happened would be witnessed not by the, just the people who were in that room, but by thousands. And we know that from where we're headed later in this chapter. So we are not left to rely merely on the testimony of 12 apostles or even of 120 people who were clustered together in a room who had this experience. In a sense, we don't have to just take their word for it because what happened had thousands of witnesses. And they didn't know exactly what to make of it, and we'll get into that, but they can all say, yeah, we heard it. Yeah, we saw it. I don't know what to make of it, but it definitely happened. Okay? Now, their, so their interpretation is diverse, but their observation is uniform. Uh, a couple of noteworthy observations that we could make about the significance of wind and fire, just again connecting to the Old Testament before we move on. Both of them, wind and fire, especially fire, were routinely indicative of both the power and the presence of God. Most of you who know your Old Testaments are well aware of this fact, that, that the presence of God Almighty himself was often 
uh, demonstrated in some fashion in the form of fire, like, say, the burning bush or a pillar of fire to guide the people by night. So this would call to mind, to the mind of those 120 and, and to us, the reader, all these years, as a, as a manifestation of the very presence and power of God himself. Now let's get a little bit more into the meaning of Pentecost, meaning So what did Luke just try to describe in those two verses? Well, he tells us explicitly what it is in verse 4. He says, here it is, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's the event that Luke had just tried to describe in verses 2 and 3. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit in power. It is the arrival of God the Holy Spirit which had been promised by Jesus himself just a few weeks ago on the eve of his crucifixion. It's time for me to go to the right hand of my Father, but when I leave, I will send a comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will convict the world regarding sin and unrighteousness, etc., and unbelief. I will send him. When I leave, I will send him. And in fact, it's better that I go and you get him. And he reiterated this promise to them in his 40 days of life on earth after his resurrection. And we read about that in Acts 1.5. And he says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we know that Jesus has in mind a specific event. And he's promising them or reassuring them of a promise he had already made. It's going to happen. And it's just going to happen in a few days days. In fact, we know the time between his ascension and the, and the event at Pentecost is 10 days. 10 days. So here in verse 4, he, re, he was referring to the same event that Jesus was referring to. He calls it being filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have two key words from the words of Jesus and from here from Luke. Referring to this event, this event describing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll step back for just a second. If we were going to do a topical message on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, it's called pneumatology. One of the things we would typically do is we would go through a list of all the different ministries that the Holy Spirit has, and we would use a lot of words like filling, baptizing, sealing, lots of things. There's lots of different words. Two of those words make an appearance with regards to this event, baptism and filling. So we're going to talk about those. We're not going to try to do a robust pneumatology here today, but we're going to talk about these these two elements of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as it relates to Pentecost. So first, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Definitionally, this refers to a one-time, a permanent one-time event that places, or the word would be immerses, the new believer, into the body of Christ. Now, it's a mouthful definitions tend to be. The word for baptize, uh, the translators in English originally, they had no idea what to do with the Greek word, so they just made an English version of that word. It was something like baptizo. They didn't know how to translate it, so that's where we got our word baptize. It's literally an invented word um, to, because they didn't know what to do with it. Now that we have a better sense of it, most commentators would say it means something along the lines of immerse. So if we want to get our translation right, we might even want to start thinking of John the Baptist as John the Immerser, if you want to get the meaning right. But not that that really matters, but the word here is baptism in our Bibles, and we'll just go with that. But it means immersion, literally. So when it refers to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is this one-time permanent event placing the convert, the new convert, into the body of Christ. One time, permanent. One of the ways this gets picked up on by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, is going to be a key passage for us in understanding the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There Paul writes, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. That's where I got my definition. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. It's a really beautiful passage. It describes this one-time permanent event, this new identity, new community being placed into the body of Christ. 
And we were all united in that, made to drink of the same spirit, of one spirit, all from different backgrounds, Jews, Greeks, etc. So that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And according to what Jesus said about this, we can think of what happened on Pentecost as the first time that that took place, a brand new identity for the followers of Jesus. They were placed at that moment in time into a body, the body of Christ. The other ministry in view here, and we get this from Luke's description of the event, would be the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now this word, we're going to see many examples of as we work through the book of Acts. So we're going to get to talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit a lot. In contrast to baptism, filling is temporary, occasional, and repeatable. So it can happen more than one time. It's not always happening and that wouldn't necessarily be the expectation. But it is a gift of sorts from the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Like I said, we'll see many examples of this in Acts. Again, we look to Paul. One of the key verses that explains what the filling of the Holy Spirit is would be in Ephesians 5, verse 18. I, I love this one because we, we, we make a mess with this verse. We... we we make it say something it doesn't mean to say. Here's what it says. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, us in our little legalistic, holier-than-thou minds, we immediately try to take every verse and go, how does that apply? What do I do or not do? That's the covenant of law. Now, I'm not saying this Bible doesn't say anything about what we should do or not do, but that's not actually the point that Paul's making. Um... He's making the point about the filling of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, exhibit A is drunkenness. How does drunkenness work? You take it in, and when you take enough of it in, it takes over. What he's doing here is he's using a very common experience, a worldly one, but a very common experience to explain a very Brand new, amazing spiritual phenomenon that is real. The feeling of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like being drunk, but it's the good version of it. You take enough of it in and it takes over. Do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. But be filled with the Spirit. Anyways, we're going to get to talk about that one a lot. That's just to get you started thinking about the filling of the Holy Spirit. So let's move on. Let's look at this reaction portion of the text. So 5 on through verse 13. First, we see the multitude, and they're just, they don't know what to think. We see the bewildered multitude. Read along with me, verses 5 through 8. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? So, one of the things that we're sort of left to figure out is how we got from verse 4 to verse 5. Because the Spirit came while they were in this room. They were, and here, whatever happened is now uh, being witnessed by, we know, thousands of people. So uh, there's a couple of possibilities. One, what happened was of such commotion, of such shock and awe, we might say, that those outside of it, they had a sense of what was going on. We know that they're in Jerusalem. We know that they're probably participating in the Feast of Weeks. And so there's only one place in Jerusalem that could have been a big enough place for thousands of people to gather, and that would have been at the temple. And so it's possible that they were in a building that was immediately adjacent to this, to this area, and they were heard, or what was happening was so crazy in their minds, that they were stumbling out already. So they were actually being publicly witnessed. So they had come out of their room and into the temple complex. We don't really know for sure, but some way, somehow, thousands of Jews have now witnessed 
the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and they don't know what to make of it. They're bewildered. We know that these men here, they're referred to as devout, devout men from every nation under heaven. So there's this unique thing because of the feast that's going on. You remember I mentioned to you earlier that there were only three of these feasts that required a pilgrimage for the men to come to Jerusalem, and this is one of them. So the occasion that sort of uniquely set this up for not just the locals to be a witness of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, but Jews from all over what we call the diaspora, the Jews from all over the world, all over the Roman Empire. We'll go into some of the details there in just a moment. But God has uniquely provided a this setup for them to be witnessed by people of all kinds of different backgrounds, which is precisely what makes what happens next so amazing. If everyone speaks the same language and those people, this crowd of people start speaking in tongues and foreign languages, it just sounds like chaos. But that was never the idea with tongues. Tongues was always meant for order, not chaos. So this crowd is diverse. They're not just a bunch of Galileans. They're diverse. There's 120 of these people who are now speaking in tongues. I like this word, glossolalia is what we call it, right? So there's 120 of them speaking in tongues, but the witnesses who are, have a diverse background and by the way, have a very negative view of the Galileans. They're, they're prejudiced. Histori history tells us that the Galileans were the hicks of the Jewish community. They were rural fishermen who were uneducated and unsophisticated. And yet they're now speaking in foreign tongues. And because these people come from places where they speak and know those tongues, they can verify those are real languages. How are these dumb Galileans doing it? Because I know what they're saying. I can verify that's my home tongue. And they weren't educated. This had to be something else. There had to be an explanation. So all of a the sudden, they're speaking these foreign languages, and that is verified by these witnesses, and skeptical witnesses at that. Now, there's a few, and we'll get to talk about this a little bit more, there's a few already immediate implications for how we think about glossolalia. I just really like the way that sounds. Uh, I'll go through this quickly. You can write these down if you like, but here's, the, here's number one. When, when someone's speaking in tongues, they're speaking a real language, number one. When the, when the Spirit is poured out and someone is moved to speak in tongues, they're actually speaking a real language established, verifiable foreign language. It's never nonsense. It's a real language. So this has a pretty direct application for today when we have people who claim to be speaking in tongues who are simply babbling, blah, 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 blah and, and claiming that the Holy Spirit has come over them. That is false. I have no reason biblically to think that tongues ever amount to anything of that sort. I believe tongues are real, and we'll talk in a moment about whether they still have a place. But we can establish this as sort of a guiding principle. To, to be a Holy Spirit filling, speaking of the tongues kind of thing, it has to be a real language. That's some of the criteria we can establish already. Another one we just see in this text that the, that the speaking of tongues is associated with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's going to come into view when we think about whether or not tongues still have a place today, uh, is we want to make sure that we understand that this is something the Holy Spirit makes happen as the Holy Spirit is manifesting His power and His presence in what I would argue is a place where He's never been established. So He's associated with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Also, this is important to understand, that tongues are meant to bridge a divide in communication, not create one. That has always, from day one, been the purpose of tongues. It is a miracle that God, the Holy Spirit, brings to happen so that divides in communication can be bridged, not to create bridges. And this was precisely the issue that Paul would then deal with with the church in Corinth. Because Corinth thought speaking in tongues was really cool. And so they spiritualized speaking in tongues. And Paul said, Cut it out. That's not what tongues are for. 
Tongues are for the edification of the body. And if you know what? If you stand up, you start speaking in tongues, and there's no one in the room he can translate, sit down and shut up. That's nonsense. That's my version, but that's exactly what Paul said. Sit down. That's, that's not how we do this here. There are rules. The purpose of tongues is for edification. It's not private worship. It's edification. It's not to create chaos. It's not to create separation. It's to bring near what is apart. Also, nowhere in the Bible is the believer encouraged to seek out this gift, which again speaks to this idea in the modern church of people who have really spiritualized and and used this as a test of genuine maturity or spirituality. I really lament that fact that there are churches that treat tongues this way, that if you've never spoken in tongues, you're not a really mature believer. I think it's deeply problematic and has no precedent in Scripture. I see no passage where tongues are encouraged to be sought. In fact, Paul explicitly says, why? What's the point of that? You know, prophecy is way better. So tongues is not encouraged. And here's the other thing. It's actually rare. We're going to go through the book of Acts, and it's only going to show up two more times in the entire book of Acts. Speaking in tongues, even in Acts, is rare. Prophecy is much more common. Miracles of healing are common in the book of Acts, but speaking in tongues is exceptionally rare. That's, I think, also somewhat instructive to us. And it's never used as a test of genuine spirituality. Okay, now let's do this briefly. The two camps with regards to the gift of tongues and whether or not it's still to be in use today fall into the categories of what's called cessation or continuation. So you're either a cessationist, meaning it ceased, or it continues to this day. Personally, I don't fit cleanly into either of these, and I'll just give you a brief rationale uh, for my view and for where I can't kind of land in this. Cessation would be essentially that the gift of tongues was for the apostles and the apostles only, and never since then has anyone ever spoken in tongues. That's just simply not the way God operates in the world today. He gave us the Bible, and that's it. Tongues are done. That's cessation in a nutshell. Continuation, you're going to find in Pentecostal or charismatic churches, and they really believe that these gifts were intended to be kind of a model and regular expressions within the church. And it's expected that churches will continue to do this. So that was would be very brief descriptions of the two camps. When I look at the Bible and try to use the Bible itself as my guide for how to determine this, and I'm trying to say, okay, so where do I go? Do I go cessation or continuation? I'm either going to call myself, these are my words, I don't know if someone else has used these words, I'm either a soft cessationist or a skeptical continuationist, all right? So, so try to be right as much in the middle as I can be. And it goes like, it's simple, really. I can't build a sufficiently convincing enough case from Scripture alone that God has taken it off the table. And it's really simple to me. Unless I can find that verse, if, if God wants to, he can I don't know of a theological reason or a verse, a chapter and verse that tells me clearly that that is not ever going to be the case. So I cannot, in good conscience, say I rest with great confidence in the camp of cessation. I just can't build that case adequately. However, did you hear that however coming? Right? However, I do believe that we can do some deducing. We can look at all the passages We can try to understand what the purpose of tongues were, uh, how often was it used, when was it used, uh, what what is the relationship between the written word of God and spoken tongues, and, and is there an effect here? And I've more or less reached the conclusion that the model for communication in the church, the long term plan, was for God's word to be preached. And that's really how he communicates to and through his people. That would be the primary vessel. It's just what's written down. That's what settles it. Um, Occasionally, I have heard of a claim here or there that seems somewhat, wow, maybe something happened there. And anyone that I've ever heard that I thought was somewhat believable 
was, was coming from someone who was absolutely on the frontier of the mission field. Meaning, they were somewhere where the Holy Spirit had never been, in a sense. And it seems to me that that might actually be in keeping with the role and the purpose of tongues on day one. It was to be a sign of the arrival of the Holy Spirit and power. And that was its purpose. And once its purpose is served, we move on to the written word of God. Um, so anyways, I'm either a soft cessationist or a skeptical continuationist. I think it's always best uh, we have access to his written word. And one of my biggest problems here on this issue is that people claim to be hearing from God directly speaking in tongues, prophesying, doing all these things. There's a whole category, and they barely know their Bibles. Now, if, if my wife never listened to me when I talked to her verbally and went around saying that she knew everything that I thought and was speaking to her, I'd, I'd kind of be, I'd have a problem with that. And I have a problem with it too when Christians who don't know their Bible claim to be hearing from God all the time. Because that means that we've rejected his written word and in preference for what is ultimately, most cases, our own intuition and our own feelings, and we've attributed spiritual value to them. And I think that's very dangerous, and we should be cautious. So it's not off the table completely, but I think some caution is warranted. We'll look at this issue on occasion as we work through the book of Acts. It's going to come up two more times. Next, let's look at this diverse and unified multitude. This is really cool. We'll go through this briefly, but let's, let's read verses 9 and 11. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So this is really cool. If you do a little research into that whole list of people groups, it essentially covers the entire Roman Empire. So it, basically, the whole world, in a way. The, 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 in the mind of the Bible reader of this day, that was the realm. That was the whole world. And God in his sovereignty, because of the Feast of Weeks and all of that, has brought Jews to be here from all over the world. So at this point, even though he said, you will be my witnesses, you know, you're going to go, I'm, I'm sending you, he's actually brought the world to them. Really cool thing that's happened here. And if you're looking at a modern map, which I don't have up here, but hopefully you know a little bit about the Mediterranean, you can picture this in your own mind. These areas would correspond to modern day Iraq, Iran, Egypt, Libya, Arabia, Western Turkey, Greece, Italy. I mean, it's a huge geographical range. And the reason there are Jews living in all these areas is because over the long history of their people, they've been in all of these places. And sometimes they get left behind and they have their communities and they're established. Uh, they've lived in these places. So there are Jews living all over the Roman Empire. But if they're going to participate in the Feast of Weeks, they need to, to get themselves in Jerusalem. So here they are. So they're diverse in that sense. They have all kinds of backgrounds and native tongues. And this reinforces for us the, the point we made earlier that the purpose of speaking in tongues was intelligible communication about the mighty works of God. Because these people of other languages testify to the fact, I understand what they're saying. They are testifying to the mighty works of God. The mission, of course, for the church is to go and to reach the nations. And yet somehow, here and sometimes, God has a way of bringing the nations to the believers. And that's what we see here, reminding us that reaching the nations is not just about geography. It's about the people. It's about the people. And the Bible is full of a, a number of really beautiful glimpses of this diversity, the, the unity and the beauty in that diversity. Not diversity in the sort of modern uh, educational sense of it that's a bit charged with layers of meaning that I would not wish to communicate or validate. But biblically, there is a beautiful version of what real diversity is supposed to be. So it's, it's frankly one of the most beautiful things about the church, 
this diversity of tongues, all saying the same thing. A diversity of ethnicities, but united as one body. An endless variety of backgrounds, but all with the same destiny. I mean, it's so cool, the unity out of diversity in the church. And that takes us back to that verse in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all, not some, all were made to drink of one spirit. So much diversity, so much beauty, and yet somehow in all of that, the message of the gospel, the person and power of the Holy Spirit would bring all of them together as one. That's the vision of the mission. And then when we get a glimpse into the future in Revelation, I love this. We're in the throne room of God Almighty Himself. There are four living creatures and 24 elders, and they are united in song. And they say this in Revelation 5, to the Ancient of Days, seated on the throne, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. He's saying this about Jesus. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language, and people, and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. The bride of Christ is gorgeous. We've all been at the wedding where the bride shows up and the groom loses it. If we really understand the beauty of the bride that's being described in here, we'd lose it. This is her, her moment. So there is this great diversity, and there's beauty in it. Finally, when we're thinking about those who have reacted to this occasion, in the last two verses here, we find both a curious and critical multitude. Verse 12, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. So we see the curious. They're amazed, they're perplexed, and they're asking, what does this mean? What could this be? I heard something, I saw something, but I don't know what to make of it. Well, there's also this critical camp. Some others mocking. You know, they're going beyond just trying to explain what they've witnessed. They're not just curious. They immediately resort to a critical, scoffing conclusion. Whatever the explanation, it must be a bad thing. And so they become immediately critical of those. Attributing this thing, maybe it's drunkenness. That's the only thing I can think of. And ugh, those crazy Jews... Or actually, it would be more like those crazy Galileans. They'd be up too late, drinking, you know, catching fish, and here they are going crazy. That probably would have been more of the spirit of it. And in the next verses, this is cool, we won't, have, we won't do it today, but Peter's going to answer both the curious and the critical. He's going to explain Pentecost to us, and he's going to answer both of those people, people that fall in both of those camps. People that have genuinely seeking kind of questions. He's going to lay out the theology, the beauty, the history, and all of that. Everything that's led up to this moment and sell it. it I mean, I call it the most powerful sermon in human history. At the same time, there are these skeptics, the critical, and he's not going to let them go either. And he's going to take them on right off the bat. We ain't drunk. I'll tell you what we are. You know, I mean, he deals with both. He deals with the curious and the critical. That's just a, a, a note for next week. We'll, we'll see him do that. So we're done with our passage for today. I want to offer uh, maybe just a final reflection here on our connection to uh, the connection of the Christian Pentecost that we've looked at today and the fulfillment of the Old Testament 
Feast of Weeks. Now, I went over this chart over here last week. I'm going to, if I remember, leave that up. Uh, we went over some of those connections, and hopefully three or four weeks of seeing that will help you in your mind to um, seal in these, this connection. Um, I've got five. I'm not going to elaborate here. I'm actually going to read these to you. Uh, I, this is from an article by someone by the name of Chad Bird, and he lays out five. And I'm just going to read one paragraph for each. Uh, they will be on the screen if you're curious and would like to know. So I won't linger here. I'm just going to read these to you. Uh, five ways that the Christian Pentecost can be seen as a fulfillment of the Old Testament Feast of Weeks. Number one, the 50-day period of anticipation. As the days between Passover and Pentecost were symbolic of the days of waiting between the Israelites' departure from Egypt and the entrance into Canaan, when they could finally offer their first fruits from the soil of the Holy Land, so these days between the Passover resurrection of Jesus and the giving of the first fruits of the Spirit on Pentecost were days of waiting. Number two, first fruits of the Spirit. As the Israelites celebrated Pentecost, they offered to God the first fruits of the wheat harvest, Leviticus 23. But at the new Pentecost, God offered his church the first fruits of the Spirit, Romans 8, 23, Ephesians 1, 13, and 14. By offering to God the first fruits of grain, the believer bore witness that the whole field and crop belonged to God, whose continued blessing was requested through the sacrifice itself. Similarly, Christ places the Spirit within the believer as a pledge that the whole person, body, and soul belong to Him. He will continue to care for that person in whom the first fruits of the Spirit are present until the full harvest, as it were, of the resurrection of the flesh. Number three, divine speech from divine fire. When the law was given from Sinai, God appeared in a thick cloud, Exodus 19, and at the sound of a ram's horn, with thunder and lightning flashes. This is all in Exodus 19. And in smoke, like the smoke of a furnace. And the mountain was burning, and with fire unto the heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. That's Deuteronomy 4. Then the Lord spoke to the Israelites from the midst of the words, from the midst of the fire. That's from Deuteronomy. At Jerusalem, on the other hand, there was the rushing of a violent wind from heaven, divided tongues as of fire, which rested upon each of them, and the apostolic proclamation of the gospel in unlearned languages. In both cases, there was divine speech connected with divine fire, but the message could not have been more different. This is where it gets really cool. Number four, the preaching of a new covenant. If the Old Testament Pentecost was an annual celebration of the giving of the first covenant, law, then the New Testament Pentecost is an annual celebration of the giving of the new covenant, grace. This new covenant was prophesied by Jeremiah in 31, established by Jesus at the Last Supper, Luke 22, and preached by the apostles at the pouring out of the Spirit, Acts 2. Christ laid upon the listeners not the ten words for them to fulfill. Rather, he proclaimed the fulfillment of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms in himself. That's Luke 24. Finally, number five, the year of Jubilee. During the Old Testament year of Jubilee, there was a focus on freedom from bondage the gift of the Holy Land, and the rest from labor. Jesus bestowed all three of these gifts in greater measure during his ministry, Luke 4. The Spirit who anointed Jesus to work these deeds is in the same Spirit who came upon the apostles at Pentecost to preach freedom from sin, the gift of the kingdom of God, and rest in the atoning work of Christ Jesus. So cool. So those are the five. If, uh, if you want, I can even send you those five. I know I went through them quickly. I wanted you to at least be exposed to them 
as we continue to work through Peter's message here in chapter 2, these ideas will get reinforced and hopefully sort of get sealed in, seal in the flavor, so to speak, all right? Um, so that's all we've got for today. I'm really excited for where we're going to look at the greatest sermon ever preached. You know, not mine, but Peter's. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. This is such a beautiful picture. You have such a, an amazing brush. Lord, I, I ask that you'd help us to see it. That when, we, when we're working through the Old Testament and we're reading about feasts and offerings and laws and finely twisted linen, that we'd see you. That we'd see that all of that was a shadow of a heavenly tabernacle. And that when you sent your son and he came into the world, he tabernacled among us. And that now by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are brought into the body of Christ. Christ, our forerunner, who went in behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, with his arm outstretched back to all who would follow him, come follow me. How amazing and how beautiful it is, Father, that you have made a way for us to enter the holiest of place and come out alive. And not just alive, but full, full of power, full of joy, full of satisfaction, a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, a new hope, a new identity, all of that because of what you've provided in Jesus. So Lord, I ask that as we continue to work through this and we, we're looking back on this great day in history, that we would hear the words of the Spirit being poured out through your servant, Peter. And that, like then, you would draw many to you. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.